service who works with your library. Uh, we have the Overdrive app, and then the one that we actually push and people more frequently is the Libby app. Uh, it's where you can borrow eBooks and audiobooks from the library anytime, anywhere. I'm gonna do like 90 seconds worth of commercials, so just stick stick with me, and then I'll get to the good stuff. Uh, Overdrive is the world's largest digital reading platform for both libraries and schools. Uh, the important part for you guys is that Akron Summit County has about 64,000 ebooks and audiobooks for your patrons. Um, obviously, that's pretty important right now, uh, seeing as how most people still aren't going into libraries. Um, so it's been a really rewarding year for us, just in the sense that we've been able to help people read and enjoy books while they are safely at home. Uh, the app that I mentioned, Libby, is um, been named one of the best apps of the decade by Time Magazine, Google, PC Magazine, and a whole bunch of others. Uh, the Professional Book Nerds, the podcast that I co-host as part of my job, we have done over 500 episodes over the last five years. Uh, we, do author ep we do author interviews on Mondays, and we do book recommendation episodes on Thursdays, kind of like what I'm going to do here in just a, in a moment. Uh, we've been downloaded over a million and a half times, and we've been featured on a bunch of fun places that I'm told that I need to talk about anytime I present about us. Um, so if you're interested, you can go to professionalbooknerds.com and you can search on our website. You can basically look up any author, genre, or book and see if we've talked about it and it'll pull up the episode right away for you. Or you can just subscribe anywhere you listen to podcasts like iTunes. Uh, we've interviewed George Saunders, James Patterson, Colson Whitehead, Connie Schultz from Cleveland area, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I won't waste any more time on that kind of stuff. Uh, my very, very quick uh, ask is that you download Libby if you're not already using it on your phone, tablet, computer, whatever it may be. But more importantly, for my purposes, if you want to listen to book recommendations from this voice and my co-host Jill twice a week, you can download the Professional Book Nerds podcast. That's us. Okay, here's the good part. Here is the best 2020 books you may have missed. Now, the last couple of years I've done this, I tried to stay away from bestsellers. And what I learned is that even if books are on the bestsellers list, that doesn't necessarily mean everyone has seen them. So I added some bestsellers this time that made the list uh, a few weeks or maybe even more, but stay with me if you're not interested in any of those. So the first one I want to talk about is called Ring Shout by P. Jelly Clark. Uh, this book posits a world where A Birth of a Nation, which is a very famous, very racist movie from the 19 teens, which came out and is actually still in the AFI 100. Uh, it's this very, very famous book that came out, which basically posits that Black people are an enemy in this book, in this movie rather, and that the creator of it was a wizard and that the Ku Klux Klan are actually heroes. What actually happens in this book is people who watch Birth of a Nation become these kind of monsters called Ku Kluxes. And this book is all about this kind of ragtag group of African-American people who are hunting them down and trying to save the world. It is a ludicrously outlandish uh, fantasy book. It is a lot of fun. The audiobook is really, really great. But if you are interested in things like Colson Whitehead's Underground Railroad, but want something maybe a little bit uh, less heavy, this is a very, very fun way to look at a book that is based on a, a movie that really does have a lot of cultural importance for a lot of negative ways. Um, P. Jelly Clark is also a professor, and he has taught a lot about the movie Birth of a Nation in his class, uh, his college classes, one of which being slavery, um, as did in movies. So there's a lot of really cultural, important cultural background in there as well. So that's Ring Shout by P. Jelly Clark. The next one came out in December. We actually did a live event with Marie Benedict called The Mystery of Mrs. Christie. This is a really, really fun book. Obviously, just about everyone who has ever read a book knows who Agatha Christie is. Not as many people know that there were 11 days in her life where she disappeared. And when she miraculously showed up after those 11 days, she told everyone she didn't want to talk about it. She claimed amnesia. They said that maybe she was in a fugue state. But she never really talked about those 11 days. And so what Marie Benedict likes to do, if you're not familiar with, his, with her other books, uh, The Only Woman in the Room is One, The Other Einstein is Another, she likes to write about women who normally have not gotten their proper due in the world. Uh, Winston Churchill's wife, uh, or, uh, Albert Einstein's uh, wife and partner potentially in all of her putting together, all of his putting together of all of his um, respective famous theorems. This one is a little bit different because obviously people know who Agatha Christie is, but again, she kind of posits what she thinks may have happened in those 11 days 
when Agatha Christie disappeared and no one really knew why. So really, really fun. Uh, it reads like a mystery, even though it's historical fiction. And again, just a blast to read. On a bit of a more serious note, Can't Even by Anne Helen Peterson. Anne was also on the podcast. And this book is all about uh, the millennial generation and how it became known as the burnout generation. This felt really, really timely, what with 2020, because not only um, are the millennial generation looked at as teens and you know young whippersnappers and these people who are just always complaining when in reality the millennial generation kind of goes up to i'm going to be 35 next week and i am a millennial um it actually goes up even older than i am and what the millennial generation really is is this group of people who have been told that they need to work and work and work for less and less and less um, and it just leads to this burnout. And this year is even more challenging because, you know, we're all sitting at a computer right now in the evening enjoying this event. Uh, many of us sat all day on a computer. This is very likely this very same computer, probably in the same room. And so there's really no work-life balance. And so this just goes into how people who are anywhere from 40 to, I think it's 23 or 24 right now is the cutoff how it just kind of became this lost generation of nothing ever being good enough and not being able to celebrate anything and trying to want more and more and more. And it's just really interesting look on the way that there really is no work-life balance, especially right now, as we're all doing these things from home. Uh, the Companion by Katie Allender. This is a little darker. Uh, it leans towards horror. I'm a big horror fan. I tried to not put too many scary books in this, but The Companion is all about this young girl who is in an orphanage because her family all died in a tragic car accident. And she is brought home by a man who was a friend of her father's and feels like he owes it to her or to him to bring her into his home. But there is nefarious reasons why he and his wife bring her in. It's to become kind of a companion for their daughter who is mute and unresponsive and just kind of sits in this giant room in their giant Victorian home. And they think that she is kind of catatonic. But what our main character comes to realize is that there seems to be more than meets the eye and there's some sinister things going on here. Um, if you've ever seen the movie or read the book, uh, we need to talk about Kevin. This has very, very big vibes of that. It's very, very creepy. It's a slow burn. And if you are a fan of kind of gothic-y type stories, this one was really, really, really fun for me personally. I said, if you're not a fan of horror, I would stay away from this one because it does have a lot of creepies. Uh, the Bridge by Bill Konigsberg. This is trigger warnings for conversations about suicide, but it's a really, really important book. And I was really excited to have Bill on the podcast this year to talk about it when it came out in September. The Bridge tells the story of a young boy and a young girl who are teens and they walk up to the Brooklyn Bridge, both of them considering suicide. And then it tells several different versions of the story. One of the versions the boy jumps off and then you are shown the story as to what would go moving forward if the girl doesn't jump and the boy does and how both of their respective lives would unfold from there. Then you go back to the girl jumping and the boy living and then both of them jumping and then both of them deciding not to jump. And in each of these different stories, you see how suicide not only obviously affects the person who attempts to commit suicide, but you also see the different ways that their lives either shatter or change or just forever scar someone else's life who may be living with them. And so what's interesting is because you get these different versions of the story, you see the people who interact with them, you're told about their, their lives if their particular friend commits suicide and you realize the things that the person who committed suicide and the reasons why aren't clear to them. And sometimes someone's in a manic state and they can be really excited or really down or whatever it is. And so it's just a really, really important book about mental health. And it does end, I will say, just because it's such a heavy topic, it does end on the very light, hopeful life of them both deciding not to make this decision. So highly recommend it. Um, I, I suggested this to uh, my sister. She has a, a teenage daughter and just just because it's something that I think mental health is really important, especially for teens, especially now when there's so much going on in the world. Pappy Land by Wright Thompson. Um, I am a big whiskey fan. You'll see me taking sips right now. I promise this is tea, but after this, this is gonna end up being whiskey. Uh, Pappy Land is a book. Wright Thompson is a really phenomenal writer. He tells a, He writes a lot of long 
form profiles on people for places like the Atlantic and ESPN. And he is friends with a very famous man named Julian Van Winkle. Julian Van Winkle is the grandson of Pappy Van Winkle, who made uh, what is basically known as the best and most famous bourbon of all time. And so this is a story all about the Van Winkle family and how they built this kind of whiskey empire and then how it crumbled down and how they rebuilt it. But it's also just a story about family because because of how close Wright Thompson is with Julian Van Winkle, uh, you get to see both of their explorations as a son and also as a father. And you get these really unique views of friendship, of becoming a father, of being a father for a long time. And it's interesting to think, but a book that is about <laughs> A Very Famous Whiskey is really a book about what our relationships mean with our children and our parents and how those things can evolve over time. Uh, next one is Dear Edward by Anne Napolitano. This came out way back in January of last year in the before times uh, when we were all allowed to go places. Um, I actually had to remember that that's when this book came out when I was putting this list together. Dear Edward is a book that discusses the life of a child named Edward whose entire family and in fact everyone who was on a plane that he was on had died in a plane crash except for him and so it deals with him as a young child trying to cope with everything that happened to him and if he's capable of living a normal life and the extended family who brought him in and how they try to help him have this normal life but it also goes back and forth between the day before or the day of everything, um, when everything happened on the plane crash, you get a, a glimpse into that day as well. So it does kind of jump timelines back and forth, but it's just a very, very moving story about how we deal with loss and how we help others deal with loss. Uh, and it's a bit of a, you'll notice a lot of the books I read over the last year and continue to read are a little bit heavy, but um, this one ends as well on a, a hopeful note. Memorial by Brian Washington. This is a very unique book in that it, it has a very unique circumstance that happens. So there is a gay couple. One of them is African-American and one of them is Asian-American, uh, Japanese-American to be more specific. And the Japanese half of this relationship finds out that his father, who is in Japan, is uh, dying of cancer and decides that even though his parents have kind of removed themselves from his life because of his decisions as they kind of think about them, uh, he decides to go and spend the last few months with his father as his father is dying of cancer. Uh, he just he tells his boyfriend that he is going to be leaving and going to Japan. But at the same time, his mother is flying over from Japan and is choosing to stay in their apartment. So you get this very unique look of the son goes over to Japan and he is you get his story halfway through the novel all about how he discusses everything with his father and how they come to be close and they work together for a few months but you also get the Japanese son's mother living with his black boyfriend and that very very unique dynamic so it's just a really again it's another beautiful story about relationships I found myself being drawn towards books that focus on relationships since I think I wasn't able to be close with my family or my friends or anything this year so this was another one that really kind of touched on those heartstrings just a little bit High Fire by Owen Colfer. This is a bit out of left field, but there is a dragon living in uh, the bayou of Louisiana. And there is a young boy who discovers some nefarious things going on with a drug runner and some uh, not too great people. And he forms an unlikely friendship with this dragon who is living in the bayou to basically foil the plans of these drug runners and save his family from everything that's going on. Um, it has all of the, if 
I, I, I really enjoy like kind of a Cajun story. And you, if you listen to the audiobook, you get lots of these Cajun accents. And it's just so out of left field to have a dragon just kind of being accepted in this story, but it is. Um, and it's a whole lot of fun. And it was very, it's very much a, a palate cleanser if you spend a lot of time reading very, very heavy books like I do. So that's High Fire uh, by Owen Cole for a lot of fun. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. This book, um, I think is actually still in the New York Times bestsellers list right now. Uh, this is one of Victoria Schwab's, I believe it's her first adult novel. She is a young adult and middle grade writer. Uh, she actually, she writes other adult books, but this is very much a departure for how, from how she writes. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue uh, is told in two different timelines. One is present day, where you experience the life of this woman named Addie LaRue, and the other timeline is uh, several hundred years in the past when Addie made a deal with what is essentially the devil to live forever, um, but she would have complete freedom over her own life. But what the, de what the devil ended up doing was giving her a life where no one would ever remember her and she wasn't able to hold on to objects of any kind. So Addie basically wanders through life without being able to have a conversation with someone and then have them remember it when she walks away. Uh, and so she basically travels the world and every once in a while, this devil kind of shows up and has a conversation with her about giving him her soul so that she can finally rest and her refusing to give up. And then one day uh, she ends up meeting this person and the person meets her, they have a conversation and the next day that person says, I remember you. And it kind of starts this whole new journey of Addie trying to come to terms with someone knowing who she is and what that means. And it's just really, really beautifully written. Uh, I feel like every once in a while, there's a book that comes out that just every single line of it feels like you could put it on a quote card or a poster, or it makes you feel something emotionally. And this was one of those books this year. Wandering in Strange Lands by Morgan Jerkins. This is a very, very powerful story about an African-American writer trying to uncover the travels of her ancestors. So she is, as it shows here on the, the cover, a daughter of the Great Migration. So her family can trace their roots back to uh, the times of slavery and what ends up happening is a lot of people who, when um, their family were slaves and they moved up to the North, they kind of lost touch with the literal roots of their family. And so this is Morgan's true story of her going through her family's history and leaving her home in the Northeastern part of the country and going down South and traveling through Georgia and numerous other places all across the country to uncover her African-American and her African heritage. Uh, it's really beautiful. It's a really, really wonderful story of discovery. Uh, and also as someone who is very passionate about trying to track down my own ancestral roots, this one um, hit me pretty close to home. Uh, Miss Benson's Beetle by Rachel Joyce. Um, this is a really, really lovely story of two slightly older women in England up and leaving their understood and known world in going on a boat trip to search for a golden beetle in Australia. Uh, it is just a lot of fun. It reminded me, I, I think I might've told uh, this group and the, uh, and the people who joined a few years ago, um, there is a book called Kath by Kathleen Rooney called Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk. And it's one of my favorite books ever. And it's very reflective and it's, this woman in her 80s who goes on a walk in New York City on New Year's Eve and looks back upon her life. This has the same feel, um, but really what I like about it is this unlikely friendship uh, of this. It's very much like an odd couple situation where one of our characters um, is very young and very pretty and she's very aloof. And then the other one is a teacher who is a little bit older and she is very buttoned up very reserved and just the situations that they put themselves in. Again, it's a classic odd couple story, but it's just a lot of fun. And again, it's just a really lovely story about two women and their friendship. Uh, Magic Lessons by Alice Hoffman. Uh, this is the prequel to Practical Magic. I feel like Alice Hoffman releases a book every single year and every single time she does, I'm going to read it. Uh, she came on the podcast uh, two years ago and it was just, it was so much fun to get to chat with her, but I, I like to describe her books as 
Um, every year, my family, since I was three years old, we have gone to the same apple orchard to pick apples. My nieces and nephews all come now and my my whole big family of uh, brothers and sisters, my mom. And this book reminds me of kind of that exact feeling of going into uh, what is essentially nature in the fall and autumn and picking apples and feeling very nostalgic. Alice Hoffman's books feel like um, that very comforting, familiar autumn, that kind of like sense of apple and that just golden color that's everywhere. Uh, it's extends the, the story, but backwards of Practical Magic. Um, and it's just really, really lovely. I recommend the whole series, but you don't need to have read Practical Magic to enjoy Magic Lessons. But it's a story of a, of a family of witches, but they are very naturalistic where everything, the spells they do and everything that they put together is all based on roots and herbs and things that come from the earth. So really, really fun. And again, it just feels very nostalgic and lovely and warming and soothing. Another book about witches, there's uh, quite a few of them in my list here. I am a big fan of reading books about witches and specifically strong, powerful female characters. Uh, Once in Future Witches by Alex E. Harrow. Alex E. Harrow wrote a book called 10,000 Doors of January, which uh, I believe won a Hugo. Um, and this is her second book. And it is about three sisters who are witches in Winston-Salem uh, during the time of women's suffrage. So you have a world that posits that there was an old Salem and there is a new Salem. And the old Salem was, according to the book, destroyed by witches and the dark evils with what these women bring to the world. And you have a new Salem where witches are outlawed and obviously so is voting by females. And so you get this really interesting dichotomy of these three sisters who are starting kind of a league of women not only interested in the right to vote, but also in the right to practice their magic. And there is dark forces, as you might imagine in a book with witches. Um, and there's also forces of light. And it's just the, it's a little bit political and a little bit, but a little bit sassy, but each of the three sisters, uh, you go chapter by chapter hearing their different points of view. And it's just, uh, it's just a lot of fun because you not only get the dynamic of women fighting for uh, their right to vote, you also get these w magical women who are also at their core sisters and who like to kind of snip at each other as siblings do, which I can attest. Uh, the Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel. Uh, she wrote Station Eleven, which was a massive bestseller. This came out um, back in March, I believe, and she was on the podcast. I was actually the only place I traveled to this year was the American Library Association's Winter Conference in Philadelphia. The one trip I got to make this year was to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, and we chatted all about her new book, The Glass Hotel, which is a murder mystery, but it's wrapped up in a literary novel that is all about this woman who is trying to find herself in, and it, it opens up in this literal glass hotel in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and you get these different points of view. You get a point of view from the owner of the glass hotel itself. You get an owner, you get a, a point of view from our main character who ends up in a relationship with them. And then you also get a point of view from her brother who is, uh, ends up working at the hotel for a little bit. And, it's just a really interesting story. It it, it really kind of defines genre. It defies genre rather. It doesn't really fit neatly into murder mystery or thriller or you know literary fiction. Um, it's a little bit slow paced, but Emily St. John Mandel is just a beautiful writer. And so you'll really enjoy every single page, even if it doesn't perfectly fit into a box. Uh, Hollywood Park by Mikel Jolet. This uh, was my favorite book of the entire year. Uh, Mikel Jolet is a musician. He is the lead singer of one of my favorite bands of all time called the Airborne Toxic Event. Uh, I actually joked with him when he came on the podcast in the uh, spring of last year that I, in college, wrote a short story based off of one of his musical uh, compositions, which is a bit embarrassing. But Mikel, if uh, his music is very prose-like, uh, you can hear a lot of uh, storytelling throughout his music. So it makes sense that he would be able to write a memoir that feels the opposite, which feels the lyrical. So 
He grew up when he was born in the first several years of his life, he grew up in the Sin Anan cult, which is uh, a cult that does not enable the parents to see their children. So the children kind of grow up on their own. Uh, just a heads up, you guys may hear, of course, it's garbage night and my dogs are not too happy about that. So if you're barking or beeping, those those are me, those aren't anyone else. Um, but this book is all about how his family, his mother and his uh, brother, and he escaped this cult and then how he learned to grow. And what's really interesting about it is he writes it in a way that when the book starts, he is very young and he progresses in age throughout the book. And he writes the way that he saw the world during that time. So initially you see the world very much in like a magical realism aspect at the beginning of the novel. Um, and then as he grows older and kind of sees the world slightly different, it becomes more grounded and slightly realistic. So it's just really, really beautiful. And then um, his band, the Airborne Toxic Event, did make a, uh, a wonderful album of music also called Hollywood Park, which goes along with this that were both released at the same time. So just beautiful stuff. Highly recommend it if you are a fan of memoirs. Uh, Ray Bearer by Jordan Ifweko. Uh, if you need some escapist fantasy writing, uh, this is a level of world building that I have rarely seen. This is the first of what will be a duology. Um, and it is a fantasy novel that is based on African lore. Um, and I don't want to give too, too much away, but all I will say is that uh, Jordan manages to take several different types of magical beings and magical powers that various characters have and explains all of them thoroughly while moving the story along fast enough and she's somehow able in a single novel to create a world that shows you the lore of that world that creates um, a history for that world and also provides you a very real and very powerful story that keeps the modern and present time moving as well. Um, it's, I'm blown away that it's only gonna be two novels in this, uh, this story because it feels like there could be more and more and more. But yeah, if you are a fan of um, Children of Blood and Bone, or if you're just a fan of uh, any type of fantasy novel where there is really good world building, this is a phenomenal example of that. Wonderland by Zoya Stage. Uh, this is described as, and I really like this description, I think it nails it on the head, if Shirley Jackson wrote The Shining. So this is a story of a woman and her family who moved to the woods she was a successful ballerina in New York for many, many, many years. And her husband was a stay at home uh, father during that time. And so when she retires, she kind of decides that it's his turn, quote unquote, to embrace his passion, which is painting. And so they go into this house way out in the middle of nowhere in the woods. Um, and it enables him to kind of uncover and discover his passion and what he truly loves about nature and starts painting these beautiful um, these beautiful images. But things start happening in the house. They feel like they become trapped and they're not really sure why. But honestly, Shirley Jackson writes The Shining is a perfect way to describe it because you're not ever entirely sure how honest the narrator is being. And the ending pays off beautifully. Um, and this is just a very, very creepy, again, kind of gothic horror book that I adored. Uh, Long Bright River by Liz Moore. This was a New York Times bestseller when it came out last spring. It might have been actually February, about a year ago. Um, this is the story of two sisters in modern day Pennsylvania. One of them uh, ha has fallen on hard times in her life and she is a drug addict and uh, potentially a prostitute in the streets. Uh, and her sister is a beat cop who frequently is on the same streets and sometimes gets her out of trouble, sometimes gets her into trouble to make sure she doesn't get into more trouble. Uh, but the sister who is a drug addict goes missing. And there is a series of murders that happen where supposedly someone is murdering uh, prostitutes. And the sister who's a police officer has to kind of figure out her own life while trying to understand what's going on and whether or not her sister is missing by choice or on purpose. Um, pretty heartbreaking, but again, it's, you get snippets of their life as sisters as well. 
Uh, books about relationships are really important to me as someone who I'm the youngest of four children. So um, I very, very much enjoy it. But um, again, this doesn't really, I don't think fit too neatly into a, a genre box. There's a little bit of a thriller mystery aspect of it, but really uh, it leans more towards literary fiction. Um, it has that kind of beautiful prose and sort of slow moving, slowly unfolding story that I really enjoy. Uh, the Year of the Witching. I think this is my last book about witches, I promise. Uh, the Year of the Witching by Alexis Henderson. This is a really, really great story about a very powerful young woman whose mother was viewed as a witch, which is not something that they like because they, she is grown, she is growing up in this very, very religious community where anything outside of total devotion to their uh, God and their the people who preach about their God and the leaders of the community is viewed as a negative. And so our main character's mom ended up dying in the woods mysteriously in the woods is where they think this darkness is from. And our main character slowly slowly understands that she has more of a connection to the woods um, than potentially she has with the church. And um, you won't be surprised to learn that there's nefarious things going on with the church as well. Um, so she is discovering herself while also discovering how she can mean more to the community and to her family. Um, and again, this is just kind of, is the story of a, a badass female. And I love those types of leads, these unapologetically powerful and wonderful women. Uh, so year, the year of the witching, a little, it definitely is horror. It, there is some darkness and um, a bit of violence, but it's just a really, really good story. Uh, Stamped by Jason Reynolds. This is one that you may have seen, may have heard of. This is the remix version of Stamped from the Beginning, which was a National Book Award uh, winning story, or not story, but a book by Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. And what Stamped is, is it's a young adult version of that because Stamped from the Beginning is a expansive look of the history of racism, not just in America, but in the world. And it's exceptional, but it's written at, in such a way that it can be challenging to approach um, if you're a little bit younger. And so Dr. Kendi wanted to create a young adult version of this store, of this book. Um, and he worked with Jason Reynolds, who reluctantly accepted because he wasn't sure he was the one to do this. And which is crazy. If you know anything about Jason Reynolds, he is absolutely the voice to make this happen. And the book is so powerful and so wonderful. But what it does is it much like Stamp from the Beginning, it walks through the history of racism uh, in the world, but it does it in a way where young adults and children can approach it and accept it and understand it. Um, and it's a wonderful learning tool. I know that a lot of schools and a lot of teachers are already using this in the classroom. I know that my sister got several copies for her kids. Um, I recommend this to anyone uh, of any cultural background. It just really helps children understand a lot of the things that are going on in our country and that have been going on in our country for uh, hundreds of years. So that's, that's Stamped, uh, which is a remix of Stamped from the beginning. Cuyahoga by Pete Beatty. This is a very, very weird book, but I really love it because it's based in this area. Um, it tells the story of this character named Big Son, and it's a story of tall tales about him. He's very much like kind of a Paul Bunyan, Johnny Appleseed type of a character. He's larger than life, and they tell these folk stories about him. Uh, one of them being that he got in a fist fight with Lake Erie. Another one being that he uh, beat up a bear with a maple tree just because he wanted to crack it and get some syrup. It's very weird, and it's just really, really fun. And you initially, it's very shocking to hear these stories at the beginning of the book. But then you kind of grow to understand, like, okay. These are tall tales about a person who is larger than life. Um, and you fall into this rhythm of really getting to enjoy it. But what I think I liked most is that because it's based in this area, it's basically this book about Cleveland and Ohio City and the bridges that needed to be built there in the 1800s and how they would either make or break either city and the long relationship between the two. And there's just all these little inside references that only people from Northeast Ohio will really understand. And living in Lakewood like I do, 
right around the corner from my house city, right around the corner from the, from downtown Cleveland and have always lived in this area. It's just really fun to be like, Oh, Hey, I know that street that they're talking about, or I know that place. It's just, it's very enjoyable. And the book itself is delightful. It's a lot of fun. And then as I did last year, and because I'm an overachiever, I can't not talk about just a few books really quickly that have already come out in 2021 or will come out very soon that I highly recommend. Uh, the Prophets is a book by Robert Jones Jr., which just came out two weeks ago. It's on the New York Times bestsellers list right now. Robert was on the podcast uh, two weeks ago. It tells the story of two male slaves who are in love and kind of challenges the understanding of relationships. Um, it's very much, it's the closest book to Toni Morrison's writing that, I, that I've ever seen. And um, as a running joke for people who listen to our podcast, I'm from Lorraine, which is where Toni Morrison is from, which I have to mention every time I say Toni Morrison's name. Uh, the Push by Ashley Audrain, who is also on the podcast. Uh, this is for people who are fans of like sharp objects, that type of um, woman on the train, like that very much like book club thriller, very fast moving, creepy story. Um, this is a story about a parent a woman who has a child and she thinks there's something very very dark and sinister about that child and whether or not um it's actually true or if it's in her head so it's very much a a thriller that is also set in in her own mind it's, it's really interesting uh what big teeth is a young adult novel by rose zabo that comes out at the beginning of february this is a werewolf novel, but it's not like a normal werewolf. I feel like anytime a book comes out about a werewolf, the entire book is about the transformation into a werewolf and this body horror. This is a story that is actually a family drama that just all of the family happens to be werewolves and there's darkness going on. And it's, uh, again, it's another kind of gothic horror, but it's just so interesting to like, not only are they werewolves and have they been this for a long time, but they freely accept it and they actually enjoy it. And so like, it's just a very big departure to what you normally see from a, uh, from a werewolf novel. And then the last one, which comes out in about a week and a half, uh, and Dr. Blaine will be on the podcast as well uh, at that time. It's called 400 Souls. This was edited by Dr. Blaine and again, Dr. Ibram X. Kennedy. 400 Souls is the story of the 400 years as of 2019 of African American history. And what they did was they got dozens of African American writers, and they each took five years of that 400 years, and write a story and an essay about that time frame. And then each of the main sections of the book finishes up with a, a poem that kind of summarizes it. So again, I am very, very big into the importance of understanding not only my own history, but African American history. And I think reading these stories helps understand how uh, our country got the way it is today. And people who are saying, um, you know, this isn't how things have always been. I think it helps people understand that things aren't as different as, as they may seem. So it's just a really important book. And it's really powerful when you get a lot of different perspectives there. So uh, if you enjoyed this and would like more, again, you can always subscribe to us on uh, iTunes or Spotify, wherever you might listen to podcasts. Uh, and if you happen to be on Twitter or Instagram, our handle is at ProBookNerds. Um, we post all of our stuff on all of those places. So I think that's the end. Yeah, that's the end of my stuff. So thank you very much. I will make sure that the library has this list um, so that you guys can write down any that you have missed. But